Hi, I'm Jeff Sharon from UCF Sports Night. You can now watch UCF TV 24 hours a day on Bright House Digital Channel 1. Hello everyone, I'm Charna davis Weesey, and welcome to UCF Expressions. Today I don't know how to introduce my guest. I could tell you he's a physicist, or I could tell you he's a philanthropist, or I can tell you he's a composer, a musician, or all of the above plus more. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Steve Goldman. I'm really impressed that you had the time to come here and talk to us. Oh, well. I appreciate the opportunity. Every one of the guests I come on here seems to do so much, and you really even do more than anybody else I've ever heard. <laughs> Which shall we talk about first? I would love to talk about your involvement with CREATE, because it's such a special thing, and it really embodies the direction the university is going into. But before, can you tell us a little bit about CREATE itself? Well. Uh, I, actually, Stella Sung would be a better person to ask about CREATE. Well, your role with it. How about that? Uh, I've been uh, working with uh, Stella and CREATE for a couple of years now. I guess CREATE was, is maybe uh, a year or two old. But uh, my understanding about CREATE is it's a, a way of looking for um, outreach into the community uh, between the digital media school and, uh, and things that could benefit the community as a whole. So uh, we're involved with two different projects right now. One is called Wired U, and the other is the Young Composers Challenge. They're both so incredibly exciting. And what's so wonderful for the university is people from different areas are all working together. So, so it's, nothing, it's not just from the music department or the art department or the film department. Everybody's coming together. Now, Wired U is not like Weird U. <laughs> It actually was born out of the Science Center, wasn't it? Well, actually, uh, it was born out of something called Wired Science, which is a pun on Weird Science, the movie. Um, and um, it, that happened maybe uh, five or six years ago uh, when I was uh, involved in the Science Center as the interim director. Uh, we were trying to figure out a way to squeeze more science into the building. Um, you know, we, we said the uh, information density was too low in the building. So people would come and they would enjoy walking around and looking at these exhibits, but uh, um, after they came back a few times, they'd kind of use up all the, um, all the data, if, if you will, and they, they were hungry for more information. So we were trying to figure out how to take some of the information that's locked in the heads of some of these brilliant people around UCF and, and make it available to the visitors at the Science Center. So we came up with Wired U. I'm sorry, Wired Science back then. Uh, Wired Science was a series of uh, kiosks which used digital media to teach uh, science, science concepts to the uh, visitors to the Science Center. And the, the interesting thing about it is that uh, you know, if you go to a classroom and you uh, are taking a science course or a math course, it's very linear. It, you do it in the order of the book. You start at chapter one. When you finish of chapter one, you go to chapter two and chapter three, and you do it at the speed that uh, the class uh, teaches the, the course at. <clears throat> and then when you finish one subject, you go to the next. And so you know, very few people get that forth through the subject. But the way people learn now is a little different. It's very random. They go on the internet and they kind of poke around and, uh, you know, you might go into Wikipedia and follow the links around to all sorts of different subjects and then come back where you started. So people aren't, aren't really learning as much linearly as they used to. And uh, the idea of using digital media is that you can uh, format the information in a way that is uh, more conducive to learning with, uh, you know, with kids today and, in, and even adults today. And more, more, more interesting. Not only are they used to it, but it might keep them involved in it. Well, the thing about a book is you you know, now they have nice color pictures if you look at mathematics books. When I was in school, they were usually black and white and there weren't too many pictures. That's before they were $100 each. <laughs> <laughs> True. Uh, but also they use computer graphics and things to generate nicer pictures. But with animation, you can do much more. You can take a, a, a technical picture, a graph or something, and you can rotate it, 
you can zoom in, you can do all sorts of things. So uh, with flash animation, you now have, uh, we now have the technology to make some of these subjects that were a little bit obtuse before, uh, you know, much easier to uh, get to. Because some people have the kind of workings in their brain that they could look at a theory of physics or of science and they can picture it, but others, it's, you can actually make the picture for them. Well, you know, it's even the people who have supposedly the workings in their brain, it's hard work. It's, it's, there's a high barrier of entry. And they may not get it right either. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it takes a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of dedication. You have to really want to be a physicist to be a physicist because it's not easy. Um, and most people, let's face it, aren't that you know, dedicated to uh, have to wade through all that, that stuff. So, uh, however, a lot of people are very interested in, in what's involved with physics and math and technology. Uh, and they're willing to, to learn, but uh, you know, they're not going to necessarily dedicate their life to it and major in physics or math. Uh, so currently there's not too many ways that you can learn about these subjects in a detailed way unless you go on to, say, public television or some of the uh, educational channels. And, and it's very limited uh, as to the depth of the information that you can get there. And science centers, the same thing. Science centers, uh, there's, um, there's a lot of kind of gee whiz, you know, snappy poppy stuff that uh, is exciting and it makes you want to learn more but then where do you go to learn it? So the idea of wire science is it, it takes you into that next step. You can kind of delve into it and learn a lot more information that, uh, that you wouldn't get in a science center or on TV. And this is, this is a real passion of yours to make f uh, concepts of physics and math more accessible and it could lead to the answers to things we've asked for many, many, t many, many years, centuries as well. Well, I think one thing it could do is, uh, you know, I think the, uh, there's a big rift between the scientific community and the general public, and that's not good for the scientific community or the general public. Uh, because in America, you know, we're very dependent on technology. It, it, everything we do is uh, based on this technology, and yet, how much of it do you really understand? You know, do you really know what's going on in your computer or how your television works? Or I still don't know how the old wired phones work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I, I can't say I do either, but, uh, but um, we're dependent on this technology, and yet uh, we uh, are losing our edge to a certain extent uh, when you're looking at how we, rake, how we rank against other countries in the world. We're still the best, I think, but we're, that gap is narrowing. <clears throat> and so we need to find better ways to, uh, to educate everyone, uh, especially the kids, uh, but everyone on, on these subjects. And it's not that hard to do. We have the technology, we have the brain power, we have the money, uh, we just haven't done it. Let's talk about some of your characters and part of the animation. Yeah. Uh, Professor Schmohawk, is it? Wired U, yes, the main character of Wired U now is Professor Von Schmohawk. I remember the name. <laughs> it's, it sticks with you for some reason. <laughs> He is a kind of an interesting character. He's he's kind of some of the professors I've known here at UCF all rolled into one person. <laughs> uh, you know who you are. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> and then there's various students in the class. Uh, it's kind of a digital classroom. Uh, there's a uh, Hulk Moose Masher who is the jock in the classroom, and there's uh, A.V. Geekman uh, who's kind of the audio video geek. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a nerdy character, and uh, he and Hulk kind of have this thing going. Uh, uh, and then um, there's uh, Adrian Science Stein, who is um, uh, a female character who kind of has a, a crush on the professor. And uh, there, the I've seen the professor. That's kind of odd. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> true. It's uh, the power thing. Well, he, he, has this, he has this machine that he can go and change the dimensions or change, send things into different dimensions or? In this first uh, animation we did, which is about a 30, 40 minute piece, uh, he uses this machine called the uh, multidimensional conformal space projection configurator uh, to take things and, and students and uh, project them into spaces of various dimensions and topologies. So he'll, he takes, for instance, uh, Hulk Moose Masher and projects him into a two-dimensional space and then curves it around in various topologies. And, uh, and I, I don't want to tell you too much about it. It would. But you do have a, f a photograph to, of showing us how not only is Hulk in two dimension, but the, the professor throws a ball at him to see what happens in it, or? Yeah, he, he passes a few things through the two-dimensional space to, s to see what Hulk would see. And, uh, and we use split -o vision which is a uh, wired U patented concept <laughs> to, uh, to show what uh, you would see and what a, someone in a two-dimensional flat space would see. 
And you also did something with the shape of the earth as well. Yeah, we, we uh, used, actually the technology that we're getting into with this is kind of interesting because we're using flash animation, but we also are using a lot of 3D graphics animation programs to generate things you couldn't generate in flash and then importing those and combining them with flash. So we're, we're kind of breaking some new ground here even technically on this. Uh, we, one uh, example is we took the earth and then we unwrapped the earth into a disk and the various other topologies to see what sort of distortions would happen. And, and then we have someone kind of pass around the earth to see what would happen in this distorted space. So. Now where, where can people actually see this? Is this a place, is this animation that, that is there a website or that people can actually go on and take a look at? Well, we're working very hard right now to finish this sequence. When we do, we're gonna put it on the web. There is a website, but there's not much on it now. It's just called wiredu.com. Um, but it's a little too soon to go to it. I think we'll probably be finished with this first animation by the end of the summer. Keep checking. <laughs> yes. What gave you the idea to do this? Now you did, you, you had a computer, a computer industry business, and then went into philanthropy and all these different things. What made you decide that, you know what, I really want to bridge this rift between the general public and the scientific community? Was there any, was there one motivating factor? Was there one impetus? I think it's just, you know, it's been my experience in life that um, it's been very, there's a high barrier of entry, as I said, to get into the technical subjects, and I, I've had the motivation to do it. It's been hard work, but when you get into it, you see the, some amazingly beautiful things, and um, things that anybody can appreciate. You don't have to be a tech head, per, per, per se, to appreciate these things, uh, and yet 99% of the population has, no idea, uh, and, it, and we, we make it too difficult, I think, for just a normal person to uh, understand this stuff, and there's no reason for it. I think, I think one experience I had was homeschooling my daughter. And she was, I think, 16 at the time, and um, I had to teach her algebra. And so we, we started going through the algebra, and, um, <clears throat> and then it just turned into practicing these equations and the you know, binomial um, equation, everything over and over and over and over so again. So I guess she, she was not really loving doing it. She got turned off to it. And I, at some point I went, you know, she's never going to have to do this. I would really like to go on and teach her a little bit about trig and a little bit about calculus and even a little bit about uh, differential equations and complex variables and some other things without her necessarily having to do integrals or, or uh, do problems. I could at least teach her the concepts behind it so she could have some appreciation of what's involved. And if she ever did want to know, she'd know where to go to get it. But she's not going to remember this kind of detailed information anyway. You know? So let's, let's paint the big picture and do it in a, in a way that's really enjoyable to show her the beauty behind it. Um, unfortunately, the public school system doesn't really let you do that. So that, that was one of the motivations. So that was the motivation to say, well, maybe, maybe other kids can benefit by this as well. Absolutely, yeah. Because, you know, even when I look at how my children are taught versus how I was taught, it's still better than it was when I was a kid. True. And you're right, you know, my, my oldest will have math that I know I've done, and I, I did well in it, but I have no clue how to do it. Well, it, has, remember it, it has <laughs> and it has left the building. It is not in here anymore, but it's true. You, you, you don't have to remember it, and you probably don't. Well, we, we get very um, engrossed in problem solving. Most education is, is based on problem solving today. So if you, if you learn math, you basically work on solving these various types of problems. And if you're doing calculus, you do integrals and whatnot. But um, people, you need, do need some problem solving, but people learn conceptually much better. And the concepts stick with you forever. You may not remember how to solve a problem, but you'll remember the basic concepts behind the subject. So we don't do enough of that. You know, it's true. I have a cousin who is president of a very large math organization. I'm not a math person. I don't even know what it's called. You would probably know. And um, they were going, all these mathematicians were going on a trip to Italy. And my sister, who is an artist, decided to go with them. And I remember we were laughing. It's like, oh, goodness, you go to Europe with all these mathematicians. Wow, it's going to be a lot of fun. Sounds exciting. <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> but when she came back, she said it was really exciting because they saw math everywhere. 
They saw math in the way the tiles, the, 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 the tiles were laid out in the streets or, the, or the, the steps by the Vatican. And she said it was actually very eye-opening that math was all around her. And I said, oh, you're changing. <laughs> you're gonna go, go back and become a mathematician. But they saw, and what led them there, something that the rest of us didn't. There's the rift. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the rift, there's the gap. So she actually did have a, a lot of fun with the mathematicians. Well, there, there's a lot of beauty in math, really. And, but you have to get into it far enough to see it. Well, something that more people will understand we'll talk about after our break is the beauty in music, which is another one of your passions, and we'll be right back. We're back. We're talking with Steve Goldman, who is m many, many things. And right now, we're going to talk about his role as not only a composer, but somebody who helps the newest composers really get to their dreams. The Young Composers Challenge. Where did that come from? I mean, were you sitting listening to one day, day thinking, gosh, I, if this was available when I was a kid, or how'd, how'd that come from? How'd that come up? Well, I, when I was um, in high school and middle school, I was attempting to compose music, and it was very difficult. Um, most band directors aren't really focused on composition because that's not what they do. They teach marching band, uh, they teach you to play your instrument, they teach you to read music, but uh, if you want to learn composition, there's not a lot of places to go. And uh, uh, so, you know, that's one of the reasons you don't have a lot of young composers, but if you don't have a lot of young composers, you won't have a lot of old composers. So part of or this any is any composers one day. <laughs> true. Well, you know, it's one of these things as we were talking about with with uh, science and math. There's a high barrier of entry. It's it's difficult to figure out how to get into it. Uh, the information is not readily available. So <clears throat> um, the idea of the Young Composers Challenge originally was just to get uh, give a uh, chance for local young composers to have their pieces played. Um, and originally we used the youth orchestra to do this. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we made the transition to using the actual Orlando Philharmonic Orchestra, you know, 65-piece group, and uh, they played the pieces on stage at the Bob Carr, and it was like night and day. It was amazing. Uh, but it was, it was so exciting. There was so much drama involved. <clears throat> if you can imagine a, a, a young kid in middle school or high school uh, having your piece played by a 65-piece professional orchestra on stage with an audience at the Bob Carr, uh, and sounding great, um, it, it's just hard to describe uh, what, you know, how that turned out. What amazes me is, is you told me that, that one of the finalists is 13 years old, was 13 years old, is how a 13 year old, especially in this day and age where music instruction is something a lot of times parents have to go out and seek and buy for their kids, how they would even know how to write even a page of a score because I don't think most people wouldn't know that one page has each instrument on there timed exactly right so they play at the, at the right time. And where did this child get that from? Good question. I think his parents were musicians, so that, uh -huh. that probably helps. Some lucky kids do have access to people who know how to do this and can tell them, but you know, most, most kids don't. Uh, so, <clears throat> in fact, that's one uh, aspect of the Young Composers Challenge that we addressed this last year, this year. Uh, in April, we had a workshop, and uh, we <clears throat> advertised on the website. It was free, of course, but uh, we thought, you know, maybe we'd have 30 or 40 kids show up. We had to actually put a notice on the website a week before the workshop that it was closed out. We had 140-something kids want to come to it, and we just barely squeezed everybody in the room down at the... Um, uh, School of Digital Media at the old Expo Center. And they were all local kids? Uh, most of them were local. They were from all over Florida. Right. Really. Um, a lot of them were local, but maybe uh, maybe a third of them were from out of town. What did they do in the workshop? Well, we had um, presenters, uh, Stella Sung, who is uh, a, my favorite composer. Amazing, one of my favorite people. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's great. She's a professor here at UCF. She presented 
Dan Crozier, who is a professor of composition at Rollins, presented. Uh, Keith Lay, who's an uh, instructor at Full Sail, presented uh, a really nice uh, section on the technology of composition, you know, using the today's software and synthesizers and sampling systems to, uh, to uh, write your score. And I presented <coughs> on the principles of orchestration and scoring. And then we had uh, musicians from the uh, OPO, the Orlando Phil, come with their instruments and <coughs> demonstrate um, how to write for the instrument, how not to write for the instrument. Uh, and, and we also presented some very nice PowerPoint presentations and gave, gave these to the kids that, uh, just to get them started. You know. Just the, the, the fact that they would even know to write in the different clefs, and it just ama it amazes me. Well, you wouldn't learn that necessarily just by playing an instrument. No. You know, I took clarinet when I was uh, in middle school, and you know, you learn how to play clarinet, you learn how to read the score, right. um, but you don't learn how to score for orchestra, you have to no. kind of seek that out. Yeah, I know, because I started on vi violin and moved to viola, so there were mine too. Right. <laughs> and then when you took the piano lessons, then you had the bass clef, and, but right. still that wouldn't have been enough. It's just, for these kids are really amazing, and to well, give them this opportunity is wonderful. Well, that's what the workshop was about. And just, to, just even to inspire them or to show them that somebody is there to support them, yes. even more than anything else. Because I know being a, being a, a music student here, they're practicing a lot of lonely hours, so you don't realize how much support you have from outside of your family. Mm -hmm. and just having a place to go to ask questions helps too. Right, you told me about one of the kids who was a finalist who, um, who actually put a poem to music. One of the contestants in the ensemble section, and by the way, I don't want people to think that to enter this you have to write a piece for full orchestra. Uh, you wouldn't want to start by writing a piece for full orchestra. <laughs> no. Start with you know a couple of instruments, maybe a string quartet, something like this. And and so the contest uh, actually has two sections. There's ensemble, and there's full orchestra. And we pick the top three of each, and the top three of each get played. And there's actually cash prizes too as an additional incentive uh, for the student and and for their music teacher. But um, um, the this particular student uh, was the first piece he'd ever written. And he took a Robert Frost poem and put it to music. Uh, three string players and two uh, female vocalists, girls from his school, that came and sang. And it was a beautiful piece. That's amazing. But you know, you mentioned the technology, and that's something that's really changed. I, I know that one of the pieces that, that you did, you used technology to simulate an orchestra, didn't you? Yes. And so that has probably, I'm sure it's certainly not easy. <laughs> to compose something for an orchestra, but you can, you don't have to conceptualize in your head what it's going to sound like. Well, that helps a lot. When, when I was in high school, you basically started with a box of pencils and an electric pencil sharpener and a big pad of score paper. And you started writing and erasing and writing and erasing, and then hoped it would sound something like what you <laughs> yeah. imagined, which of course it never does. But, and after a few times, you, get, you start learning. But, uh, but nowadays, they have uh, MIDI software where you can, just use a mouse and a, and a keyboard and uh, a screen and put the notes in. It's very fast. You can cut and paste. It'll automatically transpose. It'll automatically separate the parts. You know, take each individual part out and make a piece for that musician. And, uh, and you can play it through you know, synthesizers or music samples. Um, and it sounds you know, a lot closer. However, the interesting thing is we, at the concert, we asked the students to submit a recording of their MIDI. And the first thing we do in the concert for the audience and for the orchestra is play the uh, composer's MIDI version through the speakers of the Bob Carr. And you know, it sounds kind of like a music box. You know, it's not almost like a video game. It's not typically very good. And then the orchestra takes a crack at it. And boy, the difference is just amazing. And you tell me the finalists are very different. The ones that for this last, this last group of finalists, was, each piece was very different. It was, they were very, it was very difficult to choose the top piece because it was like apples and oranges and bananas. Mm -hmm. uh, one piece was kind of Beethoven-esque, I would say, the one by the 13-year-old. It was very classical uh, and very, very well written. One was uh, kind of cinematic. It was kind of like a Danny Elfman piece um, and also very good, but in a totally different genre. And then one uh, was very avant-garde. Uh, there wasn't really a melody. It was uh, kind of fluid and um, cyclic and uh, like glass almost. <laughs> like gla he said that uh, I think it was something about a field, a dreamer's field of stars. I think was the 
was the title, and he said he got the inspiration by laying on his back on the driveway at night and looking up at the stars. And you really did get that feeling listening to the piece. And you know, that's something that you can't teach, where to get the inspiration, where it comes from. I once read an interview with James Taylor and somebody asked him where the song comes from. He says, the voice is in my head. And it almost sounds crazy, but you have to listen to that creativity speaking to you. And for a, a kid to be able to look at the stars and see, hear music out of it, that's real talent. Well, you know, it's the difference between an art and a craft. And there is a certain amount of craft to writing music and in, in just knowing how to construct the parts and how to make them work. But there's an art to it that um, you can't necessarily teach. It's something that you have to learn on your own. It's the music bone. <laughs> it's that music bone, that's right. Somebody has it. Now, does it worry you, you, you homeschooled your daughter? Does it worry you as somebody who's so interested in the community and young people coming up? what's happening. I mean, for it was not, we did not have a lot of money, but it w didn't cost us anything for me to learn to be in an orchestra and spend most of my school years in an orchestra. But um, it's not available in many places for children these days. The orchestras? Music, even music education. It's a really a shame, and, and it's kind of an American phenomenon um, more than it is in some other countries. Uh, because there's fewer and fewer schools with orchestra programs. I think there's only two or three in Central Florida that have orchestras. There's a youth orchestra, but um, most kids don't have the opportunity to uh, really be involved with the orchestra. Uh, and there's fewer and fewer orchestras really in America. Uh, a lot of them are going out of business. Um, you know, there's a lot of competition from, from other uh, entertainment sources. Um, but there's something about orchestra music, and you know, I'm a firm believer in technology, as you know, I, I use synthesizers and everything else. You just can't get the same feeling that you can from a live orchestra. Mm -mm. There's that human component that brings it all to life. Now what we need to do to make sure that music carries on is to be fans and go out and encourage it. So tell me the website people can go to for updates, for concerts, for kids who may be interested in, in preparing for the next composer's challenge. The, the website for uh, the Young Composer Challenge is called is www.youngcomposerschallenge.com or .org. You can get to it either way. Either way. And there's a lot of information. And there's also um, uh, MP3s of the compositions from last year and the MIDI's, the MIDI version and the actual orchestra version, so you can hear the difference. So if you if 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 somebody came down here and granted you a wish of what could happen to it in the future, what would it be? Well, I would really like to see it spread to other communities. And in fact, we've had um, interest from other communities in duplicating this. We had the uh, Florida Symphony Orchestra League come down for the workshop, and you know, 40 and 50 or 50 people from orchestras around the southeast sat in uh, for about an hour in the workshop just to see how we were doing this, because it's, it's an idea that um, seems to really hit home. Uh, there's a need not only for the kids to get involved with music, but orchestras to reach out and connect into the community. And make sure they go on. Yeah. Steve Goldman, thanks so much for joining us. Do you come back you. and visit us again? Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Great. Thank you, and thank you for watching. We'll see you again next time on UCF Expressions.